Ubuntu is a user-friendly daily driver operating system that can be incredibly useful for hackers when properly hardened. Today, we'll take a look at setting up Ubuntu on this episode of Cyber Weapons Lab. People on the internet love to argue about what the best operating system is for hacking. Now, if you are a beginner, Kali Linux is by far the best community and has most of the tools you'll need at a moment's notice, and you don't really need to download a lot in order to get started. That being said, have you ever driven an armored personnel carrier to the grocery store? It's not a very comfortable experience if you have, and you probably wouldn't want to. You might find using Kali Linux the same if you're trying to use a daily driver. It is loaded with weapons, it doesn't have a lot of things that are useful on a daily basis, and you might find a couple things a little cumbersome that might otherwise be perfectly easy to do on a normal OS. Now today, I'm going to reveal a little bit of a secret. Lots of hackers use Ubuntu, the user-friendly, beginner, newbie-friendly uh, operating system that lots and lots of new people to Ubuntu, uh, sorry, to Linux, tend to flock to. Now, the good thing about this is it is based on Debian, which is the same kind of Linux that Kali is built on, so all the tools that you've learned how to use will work more or less the same. That means installation, updates, all that stuff will be basically as you've learned it on Kali Linux. However, there's a bunch of user-friendly optimizations that make it a lot more friendly to use. Now today, we're going to take into some considerations to make it a little bit more hardened against physical HID attacks. And what that means is a human interface device like a USB rubber ducky sending a bunch of keystroke injections that make the computer do something it's not supposed to do. Now, by default, Ubuntu is just as vulnerable as any other operating system against this, but today we're going to go ahead and set it up so that we have it resistant to these sorts of attacks. Now, if you get confused, you can check out the Nullbyte article written by Tokyo Neon, linked in the description, which has a really good way a description of how we're going to be setting this up today. Once you have your computer ready to go and you have VirtualBox downloaded, then we can begin. Today, I want you to open your mind a little bit to Ubuntu as a potential hacking operating system for you. Now, a lot of people maybe got made fun of at one point for having an operating system they weren't quite ready for, or maybe they just knew someone who was a kind of a dick. But either way, you should not let that scare you off of using a perfectly good tool in order to accomplish a task because, I mean, honestly, if someone uses a tool like Ubuntu in order to do something amazing, you should think that person's great, not make fun of them. So I've never really understood people who want one operating system over another. They all have their pros and cons. And in this case, Ubuntu is a super user-friendly operating system that makes it just a wonderful experience to try to get stuff done on a daily basis. Now, although I have Kali installed, as I said before, it's a little bit like driving an armored personnel carrier to a grocery store when you just need to do things like normal people do and you don't need to get into attacking a bunch of networks if you just want to program some Python or check your email. Now, one of the nice things is I find myself using Ubuntu a lot because it's very similar to Kali Linux in that it updates and uses the same tools because it is Debian based. So a lot of my hacker friends as well tend to use this operating system, so don't be put off by the fact it's kind of a newbie associated operating system. It is in fact a valuable tool that can be weaponized very easily. So I am going to deviate from the guide a little bit in that rather than using it to actually install this on bare metal, I'm going to do a virtual machine. And the reason for that is I'm on a Mac OS system and I have plenty of resources and I have the disk space. So it's easier for me to show you guys how to do it this way. However, if you want to do this on a bare metal system like I have on the other computer I frequently use, you can just go ahead and do everything the same, only instead of running this in VirtualBox, you'll take your disk image, put it on a USB drive, and then just plug it into your system and pick up from where we uh, are installing it in the virtual machine. All right, so let's get started. The first thing we'll need to do is download Ubuntu from the official website. And you can do that here uh, from the handy download site. Now, it's also a good idea for you to verify this. I'm not going to do that, but in the future, uh, you can click on this learn how to verify link and compare the SHA uh, hash of the download to the version that is on the website uh, in order to verify this is the same file that they intended for you to download. 
Now, I don't have 22 minutes. I imagine you guys don't either, so I'm gonna cancel this, but I've already downloaded it, so that's just fine. Okay, so what we're going to do is put this into VirtualBox. And now that we have our disk image downloaded, uh, if I was going to burn this and try to use this on, let's say, a laptop bare metal, I would just use uh, something to burn it, like Etcher. And Etcher is something I recommend. It's cross-platform. It's great for burning bootable operating systems to an SD card or uh, to a USB drive. And you can just select the drive, put it in here, and this is the way the, the tutorial on Nullbyte tells you to do it. It's perfectly good. I do not feel like putting a separate partition on this computer, so instead I'm going to do it in a virtual machine. But again, if you want to do it the way that Nullbyte, uh, Nullbyte's guide says to, you can go ahead and, as you see, connect a drive and just do that. So you'll plug it into your computer, but I'm not going to do that. So we'll use VirtualBox, our good friend, the free VirtualBox, in order to make one for us. So first we'll click New for a new operating system. We'll name it something memorable. Uh, it's Linux, and then it's Ubuntu 64-bit. We can set the memory size to anything over 512. I'm going to give it more than that. There we go. And uh, we're going to create a virtual hard disk now, um, but it's going to be a uh, it's going to be flexible. So we'll get into that in a little bit. So here uh, you can see the number of uh, megabytes or gigabytes we can allocate to the size. I'm going to give it about 19. We can do anything more than eight and it should be just fine. And it will be dynamically allocated, meaning it's not taking up that full amount until it actually needs it. So we'll click on create and before we can get started, we still need to do a couple things. So I'm going to go ahead and open up the oops, settings. Nope, you can't, you can't do anything. Uh, and here you can see it doesn't, it doesn't know what to do. It's trying to find a, an operating system and there's none there. So I'm going to look for Ubuntu. And there we go. The operating system I downloaded previously. And we have Ubuntu for desktop. Um, we can go ahead and press start and that should add it to the optical drive. And we'll go ahead and this should open up pretty quickly and allow us to install Ubuntu on the system. There we go. So now it is booting up. Let me see if it'll scale a little bit. No, nope, it's going to stay right there. Okay, cool. So this will go ahead and live boot. And we're going to go ahead and then install this into our virtual machine. So eventually we can eject this virtual image we're using or the um, the image file and actually run this directly from the virtual machine. Now here we can choose whether we want to try Ubuntu by just booting it from the disk image we have or if we want to actually install it. And because we do want to install this on and make it as convenient as possible to access, we'll go ahead and click on install Ubuntu here. Now we'll go ahead and select the relevant keyboard. And here we want to select minimal installation. And the reason for that is that all these web browsers, utilities, office software, games, and media players may come with vulnerabilities that could make our computer vulnerable. Now we really don't want to include anything that we don't absolutely need since we might be using this for security. So let's go ahead and just keep the things minimal for now and only install the things we need as we need them. Uh, we'll go ahead and press continue and we'll go ahead and click on erase disk and install Ubuntu. Actually, let's go ahead and encrypt the new Ubuntu installation for security, but make sure, make sure as I found out recently, uh, that you don't either forget your password or do something that deletes the encryption key because all of your data is completely unreadable without it. So since we're going to do this for security, we'll click on install now and we'll need to pick a very strong security key. Make sure you don't pick something that is, you know, like a word in a dictionary, uh, plus a number, your birthday, your best friend's name, your cat's name. It doesn't, don't, don't do any of those things. Pick something very strong um, and make sure that it's not something that you're going to forget. So I, of course, am going to strict pick the strongest password, um, super secret password. Oh, oh no, see, it's really hard. There you go. And Ubuntu says this is a fair password. Great. 
So um, I'm not gonna override empty space because I don't care. And also that would probably not be a lot of fun on a virtual machine. So let's go ahead and install now. It'll warn us one more time and say, are you absolutely positively sure you wanna do this? We are going to format this. So go ahead and click continue and it will get to work installing Ubuntu. And the next step will be to actually go ahead and set up our credentials once it's done installing. Oh, actually, let's tell us where we are first. We're in Los Angeles. All right, so who are we? Let's type in our name, our computer's name. Hmm. Uh, and then a password. And make sure this is strong enough that uh, it's going to resist brute forcing, but it's going to need to be a password that you don't mind typing in multiple times per day. So try to strike a balance. More secure is better because keep, it, keep in mind this could be brute force, but you don't want to pick something that is just going to be absolutely awful for you to type in the multiple times of day that uh, it probably will require. All right. And usually want to make it so it requires my password to log in. There we go. Now that it's been installed, we'll need to restart. And the reason for this is because we'll need to also get rid of the ISO file that we're currently booting from. So I'm actually not going to restart now. I'm going to shut down so that, okay. All right. There we go. Uh, so that we can get it to, I'm actually going to let it, um, yeah, oh, oh, now I'm going to shut it down properly. So I'm going to shut this down, power off, and then within the virtual box settings, I'm going to go ahead and remove the ISO once this lets me, I'm going to reload settings here. I don't know what that is. Okay, so we need to, first, we're gonna shut this box down. So, power off, there you go. Cool, all right, so under settings, we're going to take a look at the storage. Uh, system, that all looks good. And one thing we need to set up is shared folders. So we wanna make sure that we have a folder that we can actually access. For now, I'm just gonna make it documents. And this allows us to pass files back and forth. And we'll also set it to auto mount. So we need to make sure that we remove the installation medium and here, I can either do it by just removing the option to boot uh, from there, but I want to actually go ahead and remove Okay, well maybe it will boot without it. I didn't actually add it specifically, so let's see. Yep, okay, here we go. So normally, uh, if we had, sorry about that. Normally, uh, the optical drive would actually be preloaded, but because I just started the virtual machine and it detected it, or rather asked me for one, I didn't set this up with one. But normally I would have chosen disk image and then it would still be booted from that. So the last step of this is restarting and then making sure you're not immediately starting again from the same disk image. Now, once you remove that and you can see that this is empty, which I should have noticed, you can go ahead and start up Ubuntu and it should work just fine. Now we'll need to remember our really strong password in order to get into the operating system. And then as soon as it unlocks our hard drive, hopefully you remembered your password, we should be able to log into our user account and get started. Here you can see the username. I can type in my password. and it should boot us into the Ubuntu desktop. 
and we should be ready to go. Awesome, there we are. So we can go ahead and click out of this. And the next step, oh, as you can see, Ubuntu is eager to greet us. Uh, you'll also notice the operating system is now more scalable, so we can adjust the screen size to be more convenient, which is really nice because being locked into one orientation is very annoying. And you can also play around here with different options, like adding optical drives, adding USB things, like if you want to plug in a USB network adapter. Uh, here, you want to go ahead and set up drag and drop. Um, bidirectional is something that's very useful to have. And then the shared clipboard bidirectional as well. That will come in handy in just a second. So from within Ubuntu, you can see that we do have the minimal installation, but we have plenty of stuff installed. We can open a terminal window, and our first step is actually going to be to follow our null byte uh, setup and run this code right here in order to make sure that we're not vulnerable to human interface device attacks. Now, because I enabled my bidirectional keyboard, let's see if it actually works. I copied that, I pasted it, and of course, no, it doesn't actually work yet. I'm probably gonna have to restart in order for that to take effect. So let's go ahead and type this in so that we can make sure that when we plug in something like a USB keyboard uh, that we're not expecting, it won't automatically allow it to begin doing USB rubber ducky type stuff. All right, let's try running that as root. All right, let's see if that one works. Okay, that worked. All right, <laughs> that looks great. So then we'll run our last command here, which is now, we don't need to sudo because we are root, so update. Dollar sign tab R. And trust me, this is a lot easier if you just set up a bi-directional keyboard. Okay. And once we have done that, then we should be able to make it so that if somebody plugs in a USB rubber ducky, then it doesn't start automatically executing, it just does nothing. Now the trade-off here is if you have a USB keyboard, this could be a little bit annoying. So if you wanna go back and start using something like a USB key keyboard or mouse, you will need to disable the setting. Um, but in general, it is a great thing to have if you're not expecting to use a USB keyboard because it will completely derail uh, any sort of HID-based attack like a USB rubber ducky. And there you go, that is a hardened version of Ubuntu that is installed and ready to go. Although next time we will follow the next guide by Tokyo Neon that gets into how to do the same thing, only make sure that we're hardening against network-based attacks. After following this guide, you should have a virtual machine installed that is a hardened, locked-down version of Ubuntu that is encrypted and ready to be used for any project you might use Kali Linux for. Now, while you might need to install a couple things to get started, in general, the experience should be even better than what you're used to because Ubuntu is really meant for performance and to make beginners feel comfortable. Now, the next step to doing this is to actually lock it down against network-based attacks, but we're going to cover that in the next article by Tokyo Neon, so sit tight, and if you got confused on this one, you can always check out the really awesome article by Tokyo Neon on Nullbyte, which is included in the description. That's all we have for this episode of Cyber Weapons Lab. Make sure to like, comment, and subscribe. And if you have any ideas for future episodes, send me a message on Twitter, because I'd love to hear from you. We'll see you next time.